We have Randy Williams, graduate research assistant at the Media Lab. And you can use either one. Oh, that didn't work. Okay, there we go. Hi. All right. Button. Big button. Okay. Hi. <laughs> um, so my name's Randy Williams, and today I'll be talking about unleashing creativity. Um, so I had a hard time picking a topic. I was like, I can talk about blocks, and I can talk about curricula, so I'm going to talk about both, um, and how I'm applying it to K-12 AI education. But first, a bit about me. So I'm a PhD candidate in the Personal Robots Group at the MIT Media Lab, literally across the street. And I get to sort of have the best of both worlds. So yes, I do a lot of development. I build robots, I build agents. I do a lot of web development. But I also spend a lot of time with teachers, working on curriculum, hanging out with amazing students. And I do all of this because what I really want to see is people from very diverse backgrounds actually participating in the field of AI and using it as a medium for expression and action. So in my world, working on K-12 AI education, it's all about just democratizing opportunities. What I've noticed is that more and more AI is just a part of truly the fabric of our lives. It's both in our face, giving us Netflix recommendations, and also in the backgrounds, helping people make decisions and govern. Um, but there's some big issues. So A, there's a digital literacy gap. Not a lot of people know about where it is, what it is, how it works. And that's a big problem, because how are they supposed to protect themselves and their privacy? There's also a big problem with diversity. So the AI workforce isn't very large and it isn't very representative of the people who are actually being exposed to the technology. So with AI education, the goal is to empower people to both protect themselves, to think more carefully about how they're engaging with AI, but then also to really expand the participation in the development of AI. So in this talk, first I'm going to talk about some blocks and specifically how I design blocks to help non-experts such as K-12 students learn about AI by tinkering. Shout out to the Scratch team for already like, setting me up with talking about tinkering. And next I'm gonna talk about these AI plus ethics curricula that I build and how I bring them into classrooms. So let's talk about blocks. Um, kind of a side note, when I first started using Blockly, I was using it to build blocks to teach preschoolers about AI. So Truly, blocks are amazing. They can help anyone with anything. My particular approach is to use block-based programming to encourage learning through creating. So this sort of like tinkering, playful learning environment. As people are learning, they should be creating things. And as they're creating things, they should be learning. And the way that you make this happen is um, through these, so designing for tinkerability, the three design principles from Mitch um, and Scratch and Eric Rosenbaum are one fluid experimentation. So low floor, high ceiling, make it super easy to get started and allow users to be able to go as far as they can with it. Two, immediate feedback. So if users are going to learn as they're using these things, the interface needs to be very responsive to the changes that they make and able for them to be able to figure out what it's doing. And then finally, open exploration. So very, very wide walls. What are the pathways for expression and engagement that you're offering? And also, what sources of inspiration are you giving them so that they can sort of see what they can do with it? The example that I'm going to talk about about how I actually do this um, is ML blocks. So these are blocks that are for building tiny machine learning models. So these are deployed onto microcontrollers. And this was a project that I did with the RISE group and Microsoft Research. Shout out to Mikal and Pelly and Tom, all wonderful people. Um, so this is what designing for tinkerability looked like with ML blocks. So first, fluid experimentation. If you've ever used a Jupyter notebook, amazing, powerful, a little hard to get started with. Um, this picture on the right shows what it looks like to set up a data set inside of the ML blocks. You just snap blocks together, remove them if you want to remove a class or remove a set of data that you recorded that didn't go so well. Second, immediate feedback. So you can already see these blocks have a lot going on with them. And one thing is they have buttons on them. So you finish defining, in this case, the purple block as a model. Um, then you hit the train button and then it pops up an interface. You can watch it train in real time. Um, that helps you easily analyze and evaluate your model. And the next, open exploration. So you can export your model into make code. And then in the little demo here, it's kind of hard to see, but I made a Harry Potter wand with like an accelerometer inside of a micro bit. And I'm using it to control a robot. Like, lights on, lights off. <laughs> All right, demo time. So you can really see what's going on. Let's build ML blocks together. Hopefully this works. Ooh, the background music works too. OK, so we're kind of going to jump right into the middle of making a data set. I just snapped on a third class called Still because I realized if you do lights on, lights off, you also don't, like, sometimes you hold the wand still and you don't want it to do anything. Um, and now I'm going to create a classifier. 
So maybe you don't know a lot about models. There are some preset models that you can just choose. They already kind of work out of the box. So I will choose this one. And there it is. So these models have React embedded in them, which is something from the specific uh, fork that the Rise group has. Um, and if you were to expand those little plus buttons, you could play around with the parameters of each of the layers. Um, but you don't have to. You can kind of just use it and see how well it works to begin with. Oh no, the second video isn't there. But if we were to continue watching, then you see an uh, interface pop up where you can watch how well it trains, and then you could act, oh, just kidding. Um, <laughs> so you can see the model, how well it's working, it's training down there in the bottom. What you see here is called overfitting. This means that the model um, is, has 100% accuracy, which means it probably won't generalize very well. But for now, we'll just test it out. So I have my microcontroller connected to the interface, and I can play around, do my little gestures, and see how well it classifies. So that's what that interface looks like. Um, I should have pointed out earlier, there was like a link where you could go and check it out. Um, but there's a link where you can go and check it out um, at the end of the slides as well. Amazing. The slides will be published. Please go check it out. And that brings me to curricula. So once you have blocks like this, what kind of curricula can you build? Um, well, obviously, you'd want to build something that allows students to take advantage of all the doors that are open to them. So here are more design principles, um, but these ones are mine and my groups. Um, so when we build K-12 AI plus ethics curricula, our goal is to, of course, encourage students to meaningfully express themselves and also take action. And so the first important design principle is lowering the barriers to entry. Um, a lot of the students that we work with don't even know how to program, and we want them to get to the point where they're doing AI. And so we think about how we can make things as low cost, easy to get started with, beginner friendly, actually interesting to them as possible so that they feel that they can do it. Next, we embed ethics in everything that we do. So the lessons that we teach are contextualized and their real world impact, the societal implications, with the hope that we create engineers who can start to think like that, or if they don't want to be engineers, that's OK. We also want them to understand how the technology connects to what they do care about. And then finally, active learning. So how can the learning be as hands-on, student-driven, and student-centered as possible? Um, one of the ways that we do that is we focus on projects, because we don't just want students to learn in the classroom. We want them to take what they're learning, put it out of the classroom, and continue to have fun with it. Here's how that kind of works. So How to Train Your Robot is a middle school AI plus ethics curriculum. Um, it's about four years old, <laughs> so it's like it's tested, it's been through things. Um, so little barriers to entry look like on the first day we teach students about programming. Um, and then through the first three lessons in general, we give an introduction to all of the AI concepts that we want them to know. Embedded ethics looks like every single day we talk about ethics, we teach them about supervised machine learning models, and we teach them about algorithmic bias literally in the same lesson. Um, and so these things are really coupled together. And then hands-on active learning looks like the last two sessions um, of, or units of the curriculum are all about students creating projects, having conversations with the community, and seeing how what they've learned can apply to something that they really care about. I also, of course, have to plug our very special custom scratch fork. Um, it's called the RAISE AI Playground. It's a project both from the Personal Robots Group and the MIT RAISE Initiative. And it has a bunch of AI extensions where students can do things like image, text classification, control social robots, um, natural language processing, and reading a list, effective computing, gesture recognition, so many things. Um, and it's all in block form. And shout out to Parker, who works in the personal robots group, because we also have an extension framework that's like tape safe. It's based on TypeScript. It's super great. Um, so you can go to that link. I will point it out this time um, and check that out. But what happens when we put this in the classroom is we see that teachers are extremely excited and extremely uh, capable of being able to pick this up and use it in their classrooms. So one, they like the blocks, they were familiar. Um, a lot of teachers actually hadn't used Scratch before. They were like, well, I could learn it, it was pretty easy, and then I could teach it to my kids, that was also pretty easy. Um, so that, that's great, that's exactly what we wanted. The little gifts are um, two students showing their AI projects that they made, um, but also a lot of the students that we were working with just had Chromebooks. Um, a lot of this is like very pandemic era, and so the fact that this is no accounts and it just works on a Chromebook is um, perfect for what we want it to accomplish. Um, but then kids' projects. This is my favorite part. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time here because I just really love what students built with it. So A, I love that like, for the most part, kids made things for themselves or their friends or their families or their communities, and it's like, 
when you build AI, it's always like adults making things for kids. And now the script is flipped and they're like making things for themselves. And we love that. Next, students would make things about like their interests, so like school and nature and like sports, um, but also hardships that they were facing. So like sports injuries came up a lot. Um, I mentioned that COVID-19 was happening while we were doing some of our studies. And so lots of mental health things were coming up. Um, and as the teachers were sort of saying, like you could really see the students lives inside of their projects and that's exactly what you would want. And so big picture, when you design curricula that encourage learners to express themselves creatively and give them tools that allow them to do that as well, they can start to see how AI or any technology is very relevant to their lives, but also something that they can use to reflect on their lives and then do something about it. Uh, last slide, I kind of do like the summary slide thing. So I talked about designing blocks, I talked about designing curricula and you know, Everything that I talked about is open source, free. There are repos with links in the slides. That's my email. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm guessing questions. Awesome, yes, thank you, Randy. You can keep the mic. Um, if there are oh, already people at the mics in the room, so we can start with you, Josh. Yeah, sure. Uh, first, I uh, really want to go play with that. It looks super cool. I'm really curious to hear like when you are designing blocks to express AI concepts, like things that are outside of maybe kind of the traditional realm of blocks-based instruction, like how do you find the right level of abstraction that both communicates the concepts but is accessible enough to students? Like what does that process look like for you? Yeah, um, as someone mentioned earlier, piloting <laughs> is like extremely helpful. Um, but I think before you get to that point, um, honestly, you're getting a lot of inspiration from the blocks that already exist. So if you think about like a event block being a great example, but now you want to have an event-based classifier. Um, doing formats that are already familiar to the, your users are great. Um, and then you have to figure out, okay, how do I like not hide too much of like what's happening behind the scenes so that a user can get it? Um, for example, maybe you add another block that shows confidence. Um, playing around with that. So you think, I guess, in short, I think about what I would need to know in order to be able to do the project, and then I go back and forth with the people who I am trying to work with um, and see how much they need to sort of have that aha, got it moment. Yeah, that uh, quick follow up, like do you get then a lot of interplay as you're writing the curriculum where you're like, oh, I need to like, I need to get a layer deeper or maybe I'm a layer too deep and I can go a layer higher. Like does that, do you have a lot of cycles of iteration? Yeah, that? absolutely. And it's um, oftentimes like uh, first the, the person with the idea will build the thing and then they'll test it out with the person at the next desk and then you know over the weekend find someone's kid and like hey does this make sense to you um but yeah doing as much of it as early and often as possible yeah yeah great. thank you yeah awesome. thanks good questions um while interacting with kids is there any memorable questions that kids ask going through this curriculum oh man that requires me to use my memory <laughs> <laughs> um i think to me, some of the funniest questions, like I'm really into like mischievous kids. So the ones who are like, so how can I use this to get back at my little sister? And this, but they built it too. They were like very impressive. So they built like this car with an alarm clock on the back of it. And they were like, how can I get it to like recognize my sister's face and then immediately start just like blaring noise at her. It's like, yes, you're passionate. So <laughs> something great is happening. Um, yeah, so I think it's memorable in the use case, and I guess that sort of gets back to like the serious point I was making about like what happens when kids build AI for themselves, and how are they thinking about it differently than we think about it? Um, yeah. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Awesome. Uh, someone commented, "Find a kid is a hundred percent my most successful <laughs> user testing technique." Um, I don't. Oh, there at the playground. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see any other. Um, questions on the live stream, but I have a question. So you mentioned in the curriculum there's AI ethics tied in, um, which I feel like is really interesting, especially when kids are at an age where they're kind of still learning human and social <laughs> ethics, and yeah. now you're introducing AI ethics. So at a high level, how do you do that with kids? How do you teach them about AI ethics? Yeah, um, it definitely varies on age level, um, which is a great point. So I'll sort of describe with preschoolers, we talk a lot about what's fair and what's not fair. <laughs> um, and so I remember like one kid was teaching their robot about like healthy and unhealthy foods and they're like, let's lie to it. Again, mischievous kids, I love them. They're, like <laughs> chocolate is now healthy. And I'm like, yes, let's do that. Um, 
And then I asked the question, like, well, okay, how does Alexa get trained? Like, how does it know stuff? And it's like, oh, I guess someone taught it too. They're like, wait, could someone like be lying to Alexa? Like, I was like, yeah, is that good or bad? So they had their whole aha moment around that. Sure. Um, with middle schoolers, we talk a lot about stakeholders and like how different people may want different, like perspective taking, how different people may have different interests with the projects that they're creating um, and how they can sort of like worry about consensus. So do we make a pro-con list? Do we like do something else? And sort of just having students wrestle even through the ambigu ambiguity ugh, of that um, is like a good thinking exercise, even if they don't have like easy answers. Totally, yeah, that piece around fair and unfair. <laughs> now I'm realizing kids get that actually so well. They feel yeah. very strongly about it, <laughs> for sure, yeah. Awesome, sweet. Any other questions in the room? Okay, well, thank you again, Randy. That was awesome. Thank you.